One of the ways we can think about characterizing polymers involves looking at the chain architecture. Is the chain one, one long line of monomer units, or does it involve branching? And this leads to the contrast between linear and branched polymers. Linear polymers contain just a linear collection of monomer units strung together like beads on a necklace. Right? And although we call them linear, they're not straight lines, right? There's conformational flexibility along the polymer chain. And so linear polymers actually tend to adopt conformations sort of like a ball of yarn. Entropy tends in this direction, as we'll see in a couple of slides. And so a picture like this with the polymer chain coiled almost like spaghetti is typically how we think about linear polymers. If we introduce during the polymerization process a monomer that has three functional groups that can polymerize. So say, for example, we're doing a polymerization where an alcohol and carboxylic acid come together to create the linking units between the monomers, and we introduce a tricarboxylic acid into that mix, we end up with branched polymers. And the branching points are these trifunctional monomers with three functional groups, each of which can react to create an extended chain. Right. This leads to what's called a branched polymer, with branching in the polymer architecture. And the extent of branching here, of course, depends on the ratio of trifunctional to difunctional monomers. The more branching points we put in there, the more trifunctional monomers we put in there, the greater the extent of branching. And sort of the hypothetical limit here is a cross-linking situation where there's a ton of branching as a result of a very large number of bonds made between various polymer chains. Another extreme in terms of branching is the situation where we eliminate the difunctional monomers entirely and include only trifunctional monomers, only branching points. In this situation, all the monomers are branching points. And so this is a maximally branched macromolecule or polymer, and it's called a dendromer. The dendry prefix evokes the idea of a tree, and these are branched like trees. They have kind of a fractal-like structure where the large-scale appearance of the macromolecule resembles the small-scale appearance, since it's, it's branches all the way down, we might say. So this is an example of a dendromer structure. Now, because these are maximally branched, they have to be made stepwise. We have to make you know, the first layer first, and then add on the next layer, and then add on the next layer. These can be very difficult to synthesize in practice as a result. We can't just mix together a bunch of monomer units and just wait. We have to add each layer of new monomer units in a separate chemical step. Like small molecules, polymers can exhibit isomerism. And recognizing isomers gives us insight into differences in properties, right? Since isomers are somewhat related structurally, have some things in common, but other things different. And the most different type of isomers are those that have different bonds, structurally or constitutionally isomeric polymers is what we would call these. We've got the same formula, the same types of atoms and numbers of atoms involved in the polymer chains, but the atoms are connected in different ways. The same types of atoms in each repeating unit, but different covalent linkages within each repeating unit. As an example, consider polyethylene oxide and polyvinyl alcohol on the left-hand side of this slide. Polyethylene oxide typically comes from polymerization of this epoxide and leads to this polymer. Polyvinyl alcohol, as we've already seen, tends to come from polymerization of polyvinyl acetate followed by hydrolysis. But just to illustrate here, I'm going to put in quotes vinyl alcohol as the monomer unit corresponding to poly vinyl alcohol. And if we take a minute here and we count the numbers and types of atoms involved in these monomers, we'll see that they are the same. We've got CH2, CHOH, that's C2H4O in the vinyl alcohol, quote unquote. And we've got C2 and four H's, and let's draw those in here and here four H's there and there, and one oxygen in the epoxide. So the monomers 
are isomeric, constitutionally isomeric. So the corresponding polymers are naturally constitutionally isomeric, and I encourage you to pause and verify that by counting the numbers and types of atoms inside each of the square brackets in these two polymers. These are structural isomers. Very different properties, right? Because we've got entirely different functional groups in these two polymers. We've got a polyether in the first case, and we've got a polyethylene with a pendant hydroxyl group in the second case, and this hydroxyl group can hydrogen bond, for example, this is going to lead to very different properties for these two types of polymers. It's possible in some cases for a single monomer to give rise to different structural isomers of polymers. And that occurs, for example, when we think about certain types of conjugated dienes like isoprene polymerizing. Isoprene has two double bonds. It's a conjugated diene, right? And we can think about these two double bonds as potentially reacting in different ways. For example, we could polymerize via the more substituted purple double bond. That's going to put that uh, those two carbons in the repeating unit, like this, uh, with the methyl group, part of that repeating unit, but linked directly to a backbone carbon. On the other hand, we can imagine the less substituted double bond polymerizing. That's going to put those orange carbons inside the repeating unit, put the methyl group kind of on a hanging side chain, right? The, uh, the disubstituted um, alkene is going to end up a side chain here. We can also imagine one four type polymerization where both, because this is a conjugated system, right, both double bonds actually get involved in the polymerization. And the way this ends up, we have, for example, the purple atoms here and the orange atoms here. So this is three different ways for the conjugated diene isoprene to polymerize, and they're all constitutionally isomeric, right? We're using the same monomer to polymerize, so the same atoms, numbers and types of atoms are involved in all three of these polymers, but the way the atoms are linked to each other differs. So these are structurally or constitutionally isomeric polymers of isoprene. They're all called polyisoprenes, but more specific names would designate how the atoms are connected to each other, maybe 1, 2 versus 3, 4 versus 1, 4, for example. Polymers that have the same connections in a two-dimensional sense, but different positions of groups in three-dimensional space are stereoisomeric. And we can think of stereoisomeric polymers as enantiomeric, diastereomeric, for example. And diastereomeric polymers are much more common than enantiomeric polymers, I would say, although we can think of, of both using concepts we've previously seen from stereochemistry. And Along the polymer backbone, we're also interested in what configurations look like along the polymer chain. And this leads to three terms that are peculiar to polymer chemistry that are worth knowing, particularly if you go on and study polymers in more detail. Isotactic polymers have identical configurations along the polymer backbone at all the stereocenters along the polymer backbone. So here, for example, we have a polymer of propene where we've got a stereocenter every couple of carbons along the polymer backbone, and we see that all of these stereocenters have the same configuration. The methyl group is out at each stereocenter. So-called syndiotactic po polymers have alternating configurations at consecutive stereocenters. So this again, the second example is a polypropylene where the configuration is alternating. So I'll highlight one in purple and the other in orange, notice that we go from the purple configuration to the orange configuration to the purple to the orange, purple, orange, purple, orange, purple, orange. This alternating configuration type of situation is called syndio or syndiotactic. And as funky as this looks, there are certain polymerization catalysts, chiral polymerization catalysts, that lead specifically to this situation with the monomer units kind of turning over with each polymerization event. And then, of course, the last uh, case here is totally random configurations along the polymer backbone, and that's known as atactic, A evoking this idea of there's no stereoregularity to the polymer chain. If we look at the configurations of stereocenters along the chain, they appear to be entirely random, and this is just a small sampling of those configurations, but you can see that more or less we've got a random arrangement of methyl up and methyl down configurations as we move along the polymer backbone here. So these 
three polymers, notice before we leave this slide, these are all stereoisomers of each other, right? These are all related as stereoisomers. They're all polypropylenes. They're all polymers of propene, but they differ only in the configurations of stereocenters along the polymer backbone. So they're stereoisomeric. Another example of stereoisomerism comes into play when the polymer backbone, or side chains for that matter, contains an alkene with the possibility of cis or trans isomerism. So for example, if we start with 1,3-butadiene, sort of the parent conjugated diene here, and we polymerize it, we look at the possible 1,4 polybutadienes where the polymerization is occurring sort of at the two ends of this conjugated system, we could end up actually with two stereoisomeric products. One in which the sort of remaining double bond between carbons two and three is in a cis configuration, and one in which that remaining double bond is in a trans configuration inside the repeating unit. And these two polymers are diastereomeric, right? These are diastereomers, since they have the same connections, same numbers and types of, of atoms, of course, since they're both polymers of 1,3-butadiene, and the same bonds in two dimensions, but different structures in three-dimensional space, with a cis double bond here and a trans double bond in the bottom case. And so, just like cis and trans alkenes in a small molecule situation, these are diastereomers, and they have very different properties. Because the trans 1,4 polybutadiene has a more sort of regular zigzagging structure with that trans double bond fitting in nicely with the zigzag structure of the saturated centers, trans 1,4 polybutadiene is actually partially crystalline and has a high melting point. There are relatively strong London forces between the polymer chains of this relatively regularly shaped trans polymer. The cis polymer is different because the cis double bond kind of introduces a kink in the polymer chain, and so these don't pack together quite as well as the trans polymer chains, and so cis 1,4 polybutadiene melts at a much lower temperature, has much weaker intermolecular forces, and is an amorphous and sticky substance in contrast to the partially crystalline trans polymer. So this one subtle change inside the repeating unit has huge effects on the material properties of these polybutadienes. Finally, the most subtle level of isomerism in polymers is conformational isomerism. And it's worth keeping this in mind because a polymer with given structure, even given three-dimensional structure in terms of configuration, can occupy a variety of conformations, right? There are innumerable ways to rotate around bonds within a long polymer chain. Okay, not innumerable, but a very large number of ways to imagine the polymer chain uh, being arranged in three-dimensional space. Now, typically, we think of the polymer chain as, as looking like a ball of yarn or like a collection of spaghetti, right? Something like this, with the chain sort of wrapped around randomly. This is what's going to be favorable entropically, right? Entropy is going to encourage kind of random rotation around each of the bonds in the polymer backbone. However, what enthalpically wants to happen, quote unquote, the enthalpically favorable situation is an anti-orientation between bonds in the polymer backbone, right? This minimizes uh, problematic, for example, gauche interactions between um, bonds in the polymer chain that are going to be present when the polymer chain wraps around like this, right? We're going to have these local conformational um, destabilizing effects like gauche interactions, um, if we end up with an eclipsing situation, that can cause problems, right? All these ideas about conformation that we've already seen in a small molecule context in organic chemistry one. And so there's a balance here between enthalpy wants the polymer chain to look like this and entropy wants it to look like this. And just to give you kind of a benchmark on how this tends to shake out, a typical anti to gauche ratio, if you look at all the bonds along, for example, a polyethylene chain, is about 1.6 to 1 in a typical polymer at room temperature. So there's quite a bit of gauche actually going on in that, right? It's, it's only 1.6 to 1. So the anti arrangement is favored, but not by much. And that's really entropy flexing its muscles there, that quite a bit of gauche 
conformations appear along the polymer backbone because entropy essentially wants it to be that way. That's a more entropically favorable situation to look more like this ball of yarn and for the polymer chain to kind of wrap around randomly. 